My name is John Cyril Briggs. I was born in Leicester, in the centre of England, on the 10th of July, 1924. My father was a fitter turn and toolmaker in Royal Naval Air Service in World War I, and uh, that comes into it later, really. And my mother, I think it was Mabel Briggs, she was Mabel Goodman. I mean, you never remember your mother's name, because you don't call that, you call her mum. <laughs> my first memories of Leicester are starting to uh, things like, oh, I remember I got, I ran across the road when my brother was supposed to be looking after me, and a, a car hit me, but it was only the mudguard, and I took a bit of skin off my knees. <laughs> I was born lucky. <laughs> and uh, he got the blame. Poor brother, he's three years older. Um, anyway, I started school in Leicester and I was there for at least one day, I think. And then my father had seen an ad in the English papers by Henry Ford. If you know the story of Henry Ford, he was born in Cork in Ireland. Uh, he, he and his father emigrated to uh, the United States and he set up, made his fortune, making Model A Ford cars. And before that, there was a model something of. Um, and uh, anyway, he opened a factory in Cork because that's where he was born, Henry Ford. And uh, he put an ad in the, paper, in the English papers saying, wanted school tradesmen apply at the gate. No promise of getting there or anything else. You had to make sure you do it. Ford's test of Ford's normal automatic test of people. If you come here, you have it, and you're any good, you'll get a job. If you're not, if you're not uh, sure of yourself, don't bother. So my father took his borrowed some money, he got himself over to Cork, knocked on the gate, and said he was a fitter turner and toolmaker from the Royal Naval Air Service, and they put him on straight away as a foreman. So we got fetched over to Cork, and uh, I said I had about one or two days school in England, and then I was in an Irish school. That was fun because, uh, <laughs> with kids, because uh, your accent is different. Therefore, you've got to, <laughs> you got your fight on your head from your start. <laughs> uh, it wasn't too bad in Ireland. I was pretty, very young, then only five. Um, and I soon learned to be a thorough Irish kid, <laughs> Irish as they come. And uh, anyway, after three years, I don't remember too much about it. It was quite a happy time, a very lovely people in Ireland, uh, despite their reputation <laughs> for fighting and things like that. <laughs> but um, you've heard the story about the, the two blokes in the regiment, uh, uh, in the Scots regiment, they said, during the war and they said we'll go out and find one of these Yanks and beat him up and they came back in the morning or a couple of Yanks and beat him up you know and they were all black and bruised and so we said you pick a couple of good ones to hell with it we couldn't have found a one so we had to pick a fight between ourselves <laughs> that's an Irish story ah <laughs> uh, yes well I kissed the Barney Stone when I was about so high <laughs> and there weren't any safety rails saying they just hung me by the legs and he bend up and kiss it on the other side. You got to bend up and kiss the limestone on the outside of the battlements, you know. Nowadays they have safety rails under it. They didn't then. <laughs> it's a long drop. Ah, oh. oh dear. I always remember my grandmother and grandfather came over and they hired a car, which was unusual, you know. They had to be rich. And um, they were well, they were we were all right, and uh, we were touring, and we came through this rock tunnel in one of the around the, uh, the Irish mountains there, and uh, there's a bloke at the other side with a said, "G'day, this is so and so. You can see the view. Would you like to hear the echoes?" I said, "Of course, you know, just please." So he gets the trumpet, blows them, blows a tune, and seven different echoes come back. It's a wonderful spot. 
And then he turned to my father and said, that will be 10 shillings each, please. And my father said, he said we, we're not, we don't, uh, I say, uh, we, we, we don't come from here. We, we know what it's all about. Here's half a crown. And the bloke said, and the fashion of, of the man, how will Mary be on you? <laughs> oh, they, they're good fun, the Irish. So we never looked back after that. The family went well. He finished up. Uh, I can remember a few stories about Ireland that are uh, pretty faint. Uh, like we used to go down to Black Rock, I think it was, by train from the old fashioned train, like, like the old fashioned Queensland trains of a hundred years ago or more, and uh, to, uh, to the beach. And I always remember we we're waiting for the train, and uh, my brother was we, was, we were waiting for my brother to come from church, and uh, they said, to, they said, We're waiting for my older son, he's singing in the choir. And so they hold it and waited. Eventually, Susan came and he waved his flag and waved him on. And they, held, they held the train up for us, particularly the Irish. They held the train for us because they, you see, they wouldn't tell them which church it was. It was the Anglican church, of course. <laughs> they were expected to be Catholic, of course, over there. <laughs> oh dear. And then I started, we moved over to Essex because my father went from Cork forwards to the new factory at Dagenham near London and uh, we were in Romford uh, near, near London. Uh, he was working at the Ford factory and uh, from there he changed over to working as an instructor in the government training centre and finished up as manager of an enormous big training centre in Yorkshire, Leeds. That's how I, that's which is why I moved with him, of course, with the family. And uh, I always remember we got to Essex and Romford, and I'm as Irish as Paddy's pig by then, having been three years in Ireland. <laughs> and the local group of young girls and boys started to poke fun at me and say things nasty to me because I was. I was Irish, you see, until I hit one and he fell back and fortunately hit his head on the curb and he was unconscious for a couple of minutes and that made my reputation from then on, they left me alone. <laughs> and so we moved up to Yorkshire, uh, again a big change in accents and things, and more skirmishes, but I, I, was, I was pretty determined. <laughs> I never hurt anybody, you know. But uh, I kept my own uh, end up. In Romford I had joined the Scouts and I finished up, uh, I finished up, uh, so Essex in Rom Romford was in Essex, Horn Church actually, first Horn Church Scout group uh, in Essex, that's the Essex County badge. And I was going to school presumably to do my senior school schedule, but uh, instead of that, my father brought home an ad about this um, back entrance to the Air Force. Uh, you could go apply to go to a university air squadron, and if you were accepted, you missed out on a lot of the ground school and so on, and you got a, I got a, uh, well, if I say that I, I applied, uh, I didn't have senior, which they wanted, but I had a junior, and in junior I had topped the whole county in my maths and physics, and I got a, a very good, which is the top mark. <laughs> and uh, so they accepted me, and they sent me to Aberdeen University, and uh, I told the man I'd started work at Kershaw's, which was an instrument factory, and I was putting the the paint in the bombsite dials on them. They're making these manual bombsites they used in the earlier part of the war. When I got to the squadron, it was all automatic stuff. <laughs> um, 
so I knew a bit about bomb sites, but anyway. So I applied to this thing and I accepted. I know the factory said, this is a reserved occupation, you cannot leave. And uh, we said, we want to go. And the whole assembly line for the bomb sites in Kershaw's factory in Leeds, uh, the trade name is K. Lee, if you're looking it up. Uh, they used to make cinema projections before the war. They turned over the bomb sites and things during the war. Um, anyway, I lose the thread. Um, so we, uh, the whole assembly line said, if you don't let these two lads go, we're going to stop work, we'll go on strike. So management relented and we, off we went. I went, to, I went to Aberdeen University Air Squadron. It was delightful up there. Very different to England. And uh, yeah, there's some beaut stories about the Scots are supposed to be a bit mean, you know. Uh, there's a bus from old Aberdeen which was down in the port, that's the port area of Aberdeen. And Aberdeen, the city, was up on the hill. And the, typical of the, they say the, the Scots are very thrifty. There's a bus went up and down the hill, and the bus there was tuppence up and penny down. It cost more to run a bus uphill than downhill. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was interviewing somebody here, I was talking to somebody here, and he, he said, you're Scots. I said, where do you come from? He said, Aberdeen. I said, chop and up, penny down. He laughed like a troll, you know. He didn't, he didn't realise what I knew, you know. <laughs> it's always been with me, chop and up and penny down on the buses at Aberdeen. Yeah, you can always tell a real Aberdonian. <laughs> In any case, I, uh, I joined the RAF at the minimum age of 17 and a quarter. And, uh, oh, that's, uh, sorry, that's the proper story. I've got it now. And uh, they said, you'll have to go home and wait. And my father said, he came home a couple of days later and said, look at this, at the Aberdeen University, about the University Air Squadron entry into the airport for air crew. And I applied. It said you had to have senior, but I didn't have. I only had junior. I still applied, and I topped the school, the county in in that. So they let me in without senior. So I got uh, a Scottish matriculation in Aberdeen, and later later on I went to. Um, when did I go to university? After, oh, that's right. So then I joined the RAF at 17 and a quarter and uh, I went on and I was lucky enough to graduate as a pilot in Arizona. <laughs> There's no flying training in England during the war, obvious reasons. <laughs> they didn't want to be shot down too soon. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, they went to overseas to Canada or South America, or South Africa mostly. And we were sent to Canada and we come into this big hangar and uh, they're sending, joining hundreds that come off this liner, the Orontes I think it was, and they were all in this hangar and they separated and sending groups off to this air train, this flying school, that flying school in Canada, all the flying school in Canada. And all of a sudden they said, and started calling us, we were sent to uh, What's the name of the field? Mesa Aerodrome in Arizona. Interesting place, Mesa. You've heard of Salt Lake City, Mormon City. Mesa is number two, Norman Mormon City in the United States. And we were stationed, the, the aerodrome there was where I learned to fly. So I had six months there and I got to know a couple of Ameri American family, the Bratz, B-R-A-D-T, the German name originally, uh, and they hosted us every second weekend we got off. We went to the Bratz for the weekend, you know, for relax. 
it's very, very, very good. Uh, I think they're both dead now. Well, they're older than me. <laughs> they have to be. <laughs> oh dear. And eventually uh, I graduated and uh, as a pilot and we, we came back to England and I firmly believe that we were the last shipload of trained air crew to come in back to England and actually got to fly because they're, they produced more air crew than they to replace. They, they didn't lose as many in the war as they expected. We only lost 52% in Bomber Command. <laughs> and the what sort of losses they expected that they provided for. But uh, there was a glut in air crew. But I was fortunate. I was on the last to come back to get to keep on flying. And actually, I did my uh, uh, basic flying in Tiger Moths and, and actually in, in America. There's pictures up there of me in a Stearman and in an 86 or Harvard, as they call it in England and probably Australia. But I was lucky. I got on, got further training after a bit of a wait and uh, finished up. Um, on 166 Squadron uh, and uh, again I was lucky and you know very lucky in another way what with my age and timing um, when I arrived on 122 Squadron with my crew that was you've seen the pictures haven't you Bill O'Gorman was the flight engineer um, Ron Jones was the navigator Jackie Lover was the bomb aimer um, George Cairns was the wireless operator, Johnny Fasagi was the middle level gunner, and Fred Tanner was the rear gunner. Uh, yeah, Johnny Fasagi was Belgium Air Force. Actually, after the war, he went back to Belgium and he was fighting the uprisings in the, Con in the Belgian Congo. He got killed. I know that happened to him. Jackie Love I saw many, many years later and from a little slim boat, like the smallest bloke in our crew, he was a fat slob and he died about a year, less than a year after I saw him visit him. He was on the really down on the downhill run, you know. He'd let himself go. You don't do that if you want to live. <laughs> I haven't, I don't think. In fact, I've still got the same trouser fittings I had when I was about your age. <laughs> I have heard of crews where the skipper, and incidentally, the pilot, the pilot is the skipper, he might have a higher ranking officer under him in the crew. The navigator might be a squadron leader or something, but the skipper's in charge. And the point is a crew lives together, flies together, and they know each other, they understand each other, they trust each other. It's a, it's a complicated business, but unless a crew is like that, it's not a crew. I mean, the nearest I came was, we were walking out to do an air test, and I walked past the, the crew are assembled there, and uh, we walked out and I walked past them. One of them, I smelt liquor on him as I walked past. I said, have you been drinking? He said, yes. Okay, I said, wait here till we come back from the air first and re to rejoin the crew. Didn't do anything else. Nothing ever happened again in that, my crew of anything like that. That's how you retain discipline, is not ordering them around. They're your mates. You have the expression, of, which I'm not really used to Australian. <laughs> but yeah, your, your mates, you know, your, your group, your gang, whatever you like to call it. And if you don't understand each other, and accept each other, you're no good. Yeah, good friends are the ones you 
you know, that's it. Yeah. Uh, you trust, you, you never question them, I mean, or anything. Just leave them like the four on our dining table. Now I've been here for, since 2011, and the four of us on our dining table. We're quite different, all of us. Um, Jack was a uh, senior, fairly senior officer in the army in Vietnam or something, and uh, he's got one arm that doesn't work properly. Uh, and uh, yeah, unfortunate. I went and got it through it all, and apart, my, dis my disabilities are fairly small. The legs have got frozen solid, and the result is the veins and arteries have, de have uh, deteriorated badly. They were all right for a long, long time, but now as I get to old age, they're coming back on me. So I put them up as much as I can. It keeps the pressure down in the blood vessels on the feet. I was lucky. I came to the squadron, 122 squadron, with my crew, and um, they said, oh, that's, we, they said some such a hut, so we went there, there's 14 beds, six, seven of them were empty. So we stowed out here in the seven empty bed, uh, bed lockers, mm -hmm. and uh, somebody walked in and said, that was quick Charlie, I went last night. <laughs> but that was the philosophy of the Air Force. You never have an empty bed to remind people of somebody's gone. They filled them immediately, within minutes almost. As soon as they knew the crew wasn't coming back, there was, fight, there was a crew coming from operational training unit, bang. And it's, it's very good psychology. Excellent psychology. I got to the squadron. Uh, I did a, um, I took a, uh, somebody came as sec my second pilot and look at, watched me. I did a, uh, a small cross country trip and back. And they said, and they okay, I, they you know, didn't say I was okay, they just put me back. And then the next thing I was, uh, was second pilot to an experienced crew. They were just about finished their tour of operations. Used to be 20 something operations, I think. Flight Officer Jenkins was the pilot of that crew, I was that from memory. <laughs> and I was his second pilot, you know, in the spare seat behind, there's the pilot and the flight engineer, and behind you is the is a spare seat. So if you're carrying an extra pilot, he sits. He's in that spare seat behind the two, the pilot and the flight engineer. Flight engineer on the left and pilot on the right, in a Lancaster. Ah, uh, what was that? Anyway. The, the, my first, my first operation was flying off to Jenkins as second pilot. That was on Kiel. It was a night operation, standard for the RAF. Uh, and uh, all I remember is that we were flying up towards Kiel, and everything total dark, absolute darkness. You know, nothing, nothing going on at all. We're about one minute, two minutes away from time we should be at the target and all of a sudden lines lines of parachute flares came. Pathfinders dropped lines of parachute flares over the target. And uh, then the next second they they hear the master bomber master bomber one to master bomber two. I think I've marked the target check. Yes, that's okay, call the coal heavers in. Big red flares on the target. You know they put they put these big markers down, very very fierce flares, and uh, you just bomb that flare. That's where the target is. <laughs> and that that uh, my second pilot one was Ralph Plyler Jenkins was on Kiel, which is uh, a very big German defensive port and attack port, you know. And actually, according to what I looked up later, 
we sank, we sank the anchor between the 300 of us planes. <laughs> we sank the Admiral Shear in harbour, which is one of the German pocket battleships. They had dogs trained to detect mines in the field. You know, it would blow off when you walked on them. They, they were used commonly during the war. Uh, these dogs were, were sniffer dog, dogs, and they, they could sniff and find where a mine was and point to it. And the sappers would dig it out, you know, delouse it, and so on. I didn't have a part of that at all. That's just some of the stories I've heard. Actually, my uncle Harold was in the uh, and fighting in uh, the Middle East. Um, he was a, a sapper in the Royal Engineers, and I used to have great fun sending him an email letter: Sapper H. K. Briggs from Flying Officer John Briggs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it would be quite a funny thing, <laughs> just a sort of amusement. Uh, my sense of humour coming out. But uh, no, anyway, we did this uh, bombing of Kiel as, 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 as our second pilot. Then the next operation there was my own crew and we took off before dawn, it was dark. And what we did was start up the four engines and test them close them down and top the fuel tanks up because this is going to be absolute limit for a Lancaster. It was the last major raid of the war. Uh, and that was on Berchtesgaden in the Bavarian Alps. And we had to fly. Did you find on there there's a, a map of the raid route? But that map, we had to get from England, we had to go southish and round below the fighting area, then come back up to Berchtesgaden in the Bavarian Alps. It's a nice place, I've been there since, personally, on foot, <laughs> had a look at it. And uh, actually there's a photograph in there of, uh, of the, what was left of it. It's Berchtesgaden was Hitler's summer holiday place. It was heavily, deep dug fortress, un underground fortress. And uh, it, um, the reason we had to bomb it was before they thought, they thought, they knew, that, in fact, we were told in our briefing, Hitler's been committed suicide in the bunker in Berlin, but we think that the other top Nazis might decide to have a final last stand at Berchtesgaden. So you've got to make it a bit uninhabitable. And uh, I think there was only about 300 Lancasters on it, but it was a difficult target because it's so far. It was like I had eight hours, 20 minutes, I think, in my log, which is very close to the limits for Lancaster. <laughs> Full fuel tanks. You could do fought more with overload tanks, but we had full bomb load and full, full tanks. And when we started up and tested the engines before we took off, we started to test the engines, close them down, then re-top the fuel tanks. Then on the signal, an old signal, we started up and take straight out and off. And so we had the maximum possible safety to get back. And uh, I tell you what, eight hours, 20 minutes of the control is a bit tired. <laughs> and because in a, in, a, in a 300 plane strong cloud, with only a very little spacing, it'd be about two to three minutes from first to last bomb, to give you an idea. <laughs> uh, the air's a bit turbulent from all the planes in front of you. Probably the first plane that goes is the first one that has a nice quiet. Yeah, <laughs> after that gets a bit turbulent. I know I was very tired after 8 hours 20, but I still made a reasonable landing. Um, not as hairy as the one I made later, I'll tell you about in a minute. 
But anyway, we, we did that, did Virtue Gaiden. Uh, then that was night. That was as a second pilot to get experience. And then the next flight on my own was Virtue Gaiden, sorry. That was Keel was the first one. The next one was Virtue Gaiden in daylight. And uh, that was, I always say that was a beautiful tourist trip in broad daylight, flying over France and Germany, and we watched the the sunrise come across the light come across the ground towards us. It was dark where we were, and it was coming across the ground towards the sunlight. It's my amazing thing to see. I don't think I'll ever see it again the way it was then. Uh, Anyway, we got there and uh, we were supposed to fly up the valley to bomb it, but the, the people in the lead, we had to follow lead aircraft instead of being our own masters. And Mount Ron, my navigator, said, we should be turning now to the target. And it was two to three minutes later that we turned. Then in due course, we had to turn back on a reciprocal course and come back to the target. So. My navigator was better at the job than the people who were doing the lead aircraft. <laughs> That's for sure. And uh, anyway, we we bombed all right. And, and the landings were all a bit rough after eight hours twenty flying a plane. I tried the automatic pilot, but not in turbulent air. Following another three two hundred or so aircraft in front of me, the air's too turbulent to. The, the autopilot in those days wouldn't hold it. So you had to fly it. That's the longest flight I've ever done. We were out on some sort of... Uh, we were out on... Uh, no, we kept... After the war ended, they said, you know, you got to keep your skill up. We don't know what's going to happen now. And uh, we had various things and we did this... Uh, I know what it was. There's some German fortifications on these islands that form the north west coast of, of Germany. And one of these were heavily fortified against possible attack. And the sappers were having a job destroying the fortifications. So they, they reckon, I, I, my story is, my own thought is, they had an awful lot of bombs that were overdue for getting rid of <laughs> ducky, ducky it, bombs that were dangerous and they decided to get rid of them and the 60 of us, 60 aircraft I think went, what is it, 300, I've forgotten how many it was, um, went to bomb these fortifications, help the sappers to destroy them you see. I, I'm mixing various stories here I'm afraid. But anyway, the one about the misty bit was it must have been something like that. We came back and they said, you've got to divert. There's a missile on the ground here. It's not safe. You can't land here. And I said, well, I can see it quite well from up here. It was a ground mist. From up where we were, you couldn't even see the mist. You see the ground. And they said, so I said, and the crew said, we're on weekend off. You've got to get it down. <laughs> I said, hang on. I said, uh, I'd like permission for one attempt at landing. I said, OK, you have one try. And I came, I did an instrument circuit for the first time since I've been at flying school, I think. Time my legs and turn to come in and descend. As I descend, I got into this opaque mist. And looking through it that way instead of that way, it was dense. And I started to see trees going by me on the left and I, and I thought, oh, 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 oh. Then I saw the black and white caravan about uh, 100 yards over to my port and I've got bomb, I've got the undercarriage down and flaps down for landing there. And I did a, a 90 degree turn to port and a 90 degree back to starboard to line up with the, what was left of the runway, got down, landed and pulled up before I hit the fence. <laughs> Anyway, the crew was happy as Larry. We had the weekend off, and the flight commander wouldn't let anybody else try. <laughs>
I, I like flying. I'm, I'm very much at home flying an aircraft, you know. And the thing is, you're not controlling an aircraft. At least you're, how should I You are the aircraft and your hands and feet are part of it. And it's part of you. If you're not like that, you're no good. It's, you know, you think of getting up and walking, you know, you just do it automatically. When you fly and you think of something like the, the time when the um, American marauder hit us, nearly hit us, and that I was taken off with 24 XPOWs from somewhere near Brussels to be flying back to England on Operation Exodus. And I just taken off from somewhere near Brussels. And the, um, I, I'll tell you the other bit that comes in between. The reason we were flying them off from this one, one airstrip, which was a night, German night fighter strip, there were two of them close together. And they're flying the ones from all the prison camps into one. And I say in my autobiography, clean them up a bit and then we flew them out. You know what that means really, don't you? Making sure they're all genuine. <laughs> in other words, they've collected them in from various camps and then they flew them to this, where we were, and we were flying in and flying them out and uh, they'd been vetted. I say cleaned up a bit, but I don't say the obvious, the real reason was to make sure there were no infiltrators coming to England. That's my belief. I've got nothing to back that up in words, but it, it so fits so well. This why would you, in a short flight from Brussels, uh, from aerodromes in Germany to Brussels, why did you bring that in instead of flying straight to England? Brussels, change aircraft, and as they go through, they, they go through a little inspection area. And uh, yeah, uh, we're taking off and uh, 24 x that was on board. And it wasn't, it wasn't far up when I was, in cloud, the next thing I see this, it was, I can see it seen now in my memory. It was that angle, two engines, wing coming four, head on at me in cloud. And my mind in, identified it as a, um, hmm, it's in my boat book. But it, well, it, was, it was right, it was a twin engine like from, by, from a uh, fighter bomber, a marauder, a marauder, American marauder, um, coming head on at me. And your immediate reaction is, if you don't work, you don't live. You know? <laughs> I, mean, I saw this, in fact, the brain doesn't work fast enough to take more than one picture at a time. I've got that memory of that wing like that with two engines and the body appearing and next second, the next thing I've got is the base of that plane going across the canopy. My brain didn't record any other pictures. But as soon as I saw that I knew what he was doing and I, I twitched my wings to the same angle and dived like as hell. And next thing of course was <laughs> uh, restoring flight, proper flight before I hit the ground. <laughs> and that was a bit hairy. <laughs> and of course we had 24 XPOWs aboard. I just said to him, that was all right. It's just a yank, yank uh, plane going the wrong way around the circuit. You know, made light of it. Didn't tell him anything else. We had a uh, plane land at our aerodrome, an American plane. And uh, he, said, he said, I'm lost. Where am I? So we told him where he was. And this is absolutely true. I told him where he was. I said, he wanted to get to so-and-so. Oh, he looked at the chart and said, that'll be two, 225 degrees true. 
uh, that way. He said, none of this 235 degrees to you. Just pour it and I'll get there, boy. That's the actual answer I got. That's an actual word-for-word -word conversation in my memory. The Americans believed in quantity rather than quality. You produce a hundred instead of one, a good one, you produce a hundred and the survivors will be right. That was their attitude, the Americans. I know, I trained at Mesa in America, but it's a British flying school with American civilian instructors, not, a, not a Army Air Corps, and they were good. They were, they were very good. But the Yanks, quantity before quality, I'm afraid it's true. We knew where we were all the time. My navigator was spot on. As a matter of fact, he's probably dead now because he was, he was the oldest member of the crew. He was five years older than me. He was 25. I was 20. And uh, he went to, um, he went from the Air Force to uh, BOAC as a uh, navigator flying uh, the uh, flying boats from here to Singapore. From, no, not from here, from England to Singapore. <laughs> and uh, eventually he finished up as chief navigator for, for um, Singapore Airlines, SAO. He finished up as chief navigator of Singapore Airlines. I've lost track of him, he's probably dead now anyway. He's five years older than me and I'm 95. <laughs> he wouldn't be fit to fly anyway. I flew RF in England, right? Courtesy of that, I went to university at uh, Leeds University and did a degree in civil engineering. I had thought it all out. I'm an experienced pilot, reasonably, not highly experienced, but I was confident. And uh, I thought there's going to be an awful lot of pilots and other people like that looking for jobs. Commercial flying is not on. And another thing is the commercial pilots are bus drivers and they, they're on shifts, you know, they never know from one day to the next when they're flying and things like that. You're, and in any case, if you go commercial flying, you, every six months you get a health check, a, a complete health check. And if you don't pass, you're out. Or at least laid back for a while till you recover, if, whatever it is. It's an, I mean, you've got to be 100% a, a, a commercial pilot. Um, so I ruled that out. And uh, the other thing is, I showed you my picture of the of walking in the snow in Yorkshire. <laughs> I remember once, and I um, oh, I haven't. It's not in my memoirs at all. If I tell you this, don't make too much of it, okay? Uh, I was doing week after the war finished. I got my degree in university. And I, uh, but I, I still was in the RAF Volunteer Reserve, which meant I could get, I did start this sometime later, they started it back up. Um, I was on their list. I did, at weekends, I went out to the local aerodrome, the, the pointed aerodrome, you know, uh, Bruff or somewhere like that, and uh, got flying a, a tiger moth to keep my hand in and that sort of thing, all for free. And it was beautiful, <laughs> flying the tiger moth for fun. And the time I got into trouble, this is not anywhere written. So if I tell you that, we can forget it, okay. <laughs> I, uh, I had, a, I was allowed, I suggested I do a, a trip to where the squadron was, 122. No, 49 squadron I've moved to, 
As I tell you, I moved from 22, 122 in the war to 49 to go to uh, Tiger Force to bomb Japan, which folded up when the Japanese heard we were coming and gave in. That was my story. There was a couple of atom bombs as well, but don't worry about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, used to, so on this reserve, there's a volunteer reserve, they they like to keep your skills up, so we we went weekends we we went and flew around a bit, you see, and one was a long weekend, and uh, I said, uh, any chance of me doing a cross country to 49 Squadron to see some other squadron? From here on, this doesn't go anywhere. Okay, for you and me. Uh, so they said, okay. So I arranged that and I flew the Tiger Moth down to, I can't even remember the name of the place now, um, to where the squadron was and went, walked into the mess and they said, oh, yeah, have a drink. Uh -uh. I should have said no. I had half a pint of mild, light English beer. That's all. I took off after chatting to the boys a bit. I took off to come back. And that's when I did something stupid. I flew around the control tower. I was perfectly safe what I was doing. I knew what I was doing. I arrived back and I'm under arrest. <laughs> There's some ground, not an aircraft. Air, one, air, not an air crew man, some ground squadron leader reported me for what he did. This is where I got off actually, um, and I was on a charge. So I had to go back, reported by uniform and everything, and uh, on charge. And they, uh, yeah, fly off the bridge. Mm. Uh, it's squadron leader so and so reports that you did a stall turn round the control tower. A sense of relief, enormous relief. I just said, sir, if I had done a stall turn round the control tower, at, at 50 feet, he said, if I had done a stall turn round the control tower at 50 feet, I would not be standing here talking to you now, sir. All right, he said, forget the evidence. You shot the police up. I said, yes, sir. May I ask why? I said, well, I had that morning received the information from the Leeds University that I had passed my final exams, and I was in a somewhat joyous mood. All right, he said, leave the room. A couple of minutes later, he said, come back in. He said, Simon Briggs, you are reprimanded. I said, thank you, sir. <laughs> Reprimand goes off your records in, three, in 12 months. It's the lowest possible discipline reaction. There's nothing lower than that except dismissing it altogether. <laughs> now that's not anywhere in my stories. So please keep it to yourself. I took a job in Victoria from university in Leeds. I, uh, I think I did a little bit of work experience in Grimsby on uh, so, uh, yeah, we did some work experience on uh, building an underground sewage pumping station in Grimsby, um, Pie Wipe, Grimsby. Um, it was to raise the sewage uh, above tide level so it could go out all the time instead of being only at low tide. They had tide gates on the sewer, which closed it as the tide came in. And then when it fell, they opened and it came out. I remember once I was, uh, we were building this, and I was walking across the light railway bridge, which was a very flimsy good, a little good bridge with two foot gauge railway on it, taking supplies out to the job and things. And uh, I had the area manager with me, and I said to him, I to explain the job, and what we were doing. I was in charge of building this underground sewage pumping station. And uh, I suddenly saw the tide gate swinging open. I started to run, <laughs> and the air man says, "What the?" Then he passed me. That fish, that sewage 
was from the area where all the fish mill factories are and things like that, where they press the, the residue to get cod liver oil for kids, you know, and things like that under steam pressure and things. That the, when those tide gates opened to let the pent up stuff out, it was not, it was not bad. It was intolerable, the smell really was. Because I remember this time I saw the tide gates open and I started to run. And the, the hairy man says, what the? And then he passed me. <laughs> he got it. <laughs> but this was my, one of my first, that was a, straight from university, that was a, I did about it. I, did, I don't know how long I did, but less than a year probably. And then I got this, I got the opportunity to go to Victoria as a civil engineer on uh, Irrigation and Water Supply Commission for Victoria uh, for three years. And um, I enjoyed that. I, had, I was managing the whole of Victoria virtually, or most, most of the area where this thing was, uh, it's, uh, water supply and, and uh, so on. And we had dams and things and pipes and all sorts of things and, you know, keeping everything under control and building new ones and things like that. And then at the end of the three years, Fred Bunting and a friend of mine that had been with me for a few years, uh, we decided to um, quit and go to North, the, the jobs when it were far and few between in England. It was, the tr it was dying, there was not much on offer. Mm. And we decided to go home and go to North America, to Canada, to where there were some decent jobs offering, new dam works and things like that. There was a group, I got in in Melbourne, and if you come from Sydney, and there's a group of girls from, oh, this horrible Northern Terry called Queensland, isn't it? <laughs> and, they welcomed us aboard. All I can say is this, we walked past them, and my whole body said, that's her. Just like that. So I carefully, Fred and I carefully looked after her and she was traveling with another lady. We carefully looked after them each port we came to, made sure that they were safe going ashore in these foreign points, ports, you know. And uh, on the final leg to England, they were in the Red Sea, I think it's called, and uh, sitting there in the deck chair and here, and Joyce is in the deck chair there, and I said, I just walked over and said, will you marry me? The two second, one second pause, she said, yes. I never ever said in my life to her, well, I love you or anything like that. We didn't have to. We knew each other. And that's, that's absolutely true. So when I got home, they were going on this trip around Europe and so on. So the agreement was that she'd come and stay with us at my home when she got back, instead of going back to Australia. And uh, uh, so she came, she came and uh, I said, I said to the family, well, we're going to get married. <laughs> so we went out, we bought a ring, and uh, I had, I got a week off work, we had a honeymoon of one week. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I always remember, it was the Yorkshire Dales, I showed you that picture, my favourite picture. I love the Yorkshire Dales beautiful country and uh, I had this place in, on the Yorkshire Dales where there was a, a little pub rooms you know I, I rang them up I said I want a room for two and uh, I always remember and we arrived there and they showed us into this room and we'd been married that day and we walked into this room <laughs> 
and it's got twin beds, you see. <laughs> and it looks this and it's late at night, it's fairly late in the evening, you know. Oh well. You gotta put away what you got. And so we occupied one of the twin beds. <laughs> uh, and next morning the land the landlady here in public and the lady came to me and said, I'm sorry about that. I said she said, I didn't realise. How she found out I don't know, but she, he said, I didn't realise. You must have realised when we'd only used one bed. <laughs> so I, my week's honeymoon on the Yorkshire Moors, we, we were changed from that. It was a beautiful room with twin beds and a beautiful outlook. And we changed to a room at the back of the place with a double bed, no view, which well, didn't worry us at all. <laughs> My, my wife is Australian, so I was Australian from then on. <laughs> Actual fact, I became, in those days, not all the problems about trans passports and things that there are now. Um, I, I said, I was born lucky. I, my guidance on were at times when you could do these things without getting pushed around and uh, all I did was, we were back here, we got married and we were in Queensland, living in Queensland, and um, she was an Australian, she was born in Toowoomba. Uh, her father was Hunter Poon, who was a, a well-known sportsman. Uh, he was a, uh, he had been badly wounded in the First World War on the Somme the same battle that my Uncle John was killed in, that I'm named after. Now there's a coincidence. <laughs> We've checked the records and so on, can't prove this. Because uh, the, the Leicesters that my Uncle John was in went up the line to relieve the, the Australians in the First World War. So, actually the families had met before. <laughs> Stranger than fiction is strange, stranger than fiction, you know. And uh, that's true. After we got married, I found a job in Queensland. For my first three years in Australia was in Victoria, in building Big Hill and Dam. I was in the design office and then on the, on the, in the field supervising the construction of it. I'll design and build the house. You look after the money. They stayed that way ever since. Anything about the house, doing it up or anything like that was mine. Anything about money, I didn't have to. I was Jay's choice. Can we afford so and so? She said, yes. Fine. That's all I had to do. Uh, Strawn taking me to the 100th anniversary of the Tawang RSL on Saturday, a luncheon. Um, Janelle usually comes on a Sunday afternoon. Robin always comes on a Friday night, Friday evening. The main reason for that is, I think, <laughs> he became a Pentecostal church boy. Sunday is all church. Joyce and I, my wife when she was alive, we went to visit them once. At a, you know, I went to one of their services once. And after about 10 minutes, Joyce said, I don't feel very well. I said, I'll take you outside. We never went back in. <laughs> I'm afraid this hot, hot gospel of stuff is not my alley. Actually, we were in uh, 46 12th Avenue, St. Lucia, was the house I built. The first house, and then we bought, actually we bought, with Joyce, Joyce would go around and say, with the such and such a house that would be worth buying, I think. And my job was to go around and check it for uh, stability and toughness. And, you know, they were secure as a home. And we had about five or six houses. And we used to let them to students at, at well below the going rate for student accommodation. Because 
There's a lot of students, foreign students and all sorts go to Leeds to Queensland University and St Lucia's so five minutes walk from it. And uh, so we did a good turn to others and to ourselves we, because we bought these houses and then in due course the, the value of the land went up and up and up and I became worth a couple of million without even turning a finger just on the property we bought. And that's why I say I was lucky, born lucky. You know, it, it just came to me. Uh, anyway, uh, Robin now runs his own civil engineer, he was a civil engineer, runs his own business as an estimator. Uh, he will estimate prices for contractors to put in for tenders for big construction jobs. That's, that's what he finished up doing, doing estimating as a job for, and then people employ him because they uh, found he's pretty good at doing it. He's got the background in civil engineering that I had, that I had and he was a civil engineer. Strawn, um, I don't know, <laughs> if I say that too much, too, all that much about him, he's a bit of a mystery man, but he, he keeps himself well afloat, he's well ahead of everything, yeah, he's, he's bright like me, he's applied in a different way, sort of. He doesn't know anything illegal, but he, he knows how to make a penny here and there, and does. That's all I'm going to say, because I don't really know anything about Strawn, except that he, he's happily, that all three are happily married. Actually, go further. Robin, the big eldest, got married, and it was like, a rock. That's it. Full stop. They have uh, three boys, I think. I haven't got pictures of them. Anyway, two or three boys, and uh, they have been solid as a rock married, and uh, they're Pentecostal church. <laughs> but they're happy. They've never, there's never been a slightest trouble between them. The other two both got married and were divorced after three years. Janelle came to me in tears. Don't, this doesn't go too public. Janelle came to me and uh, cried on my shoulder. And, anyway, they both got divorced and they both very happily remarried. And they've both got families. Like Robin. Uh, so they're all very happy. I never, it's not my place to pry into these sort of things. That's, that's their business. They're adults. Go for what you want. Always have a sense of humour. Never lose it. And you'll get there. If you've got what it takes. But I mean, Everybody's different. You've made it in what you're doing. I made it in civil engineering. They've all got family and uh, they all come and see me, you know. But I have to look up the names of the grandchildren and things. I haven't got any great grandchildren. I think they've uh, they're intelligent enough to decide this world's going in a way that it's not good for the future. I mean that, whether you've ever thought about it. It's, the world's got to, could, could blow itself up at any time if it wanted to. And, ah, uh, uh, yeah. I don't get into politics. Most people here are happy, I think, reasonably happy. I've never met any really unhappy ones, but some people are all different. You're speaking about a group of people who are all different. And 
it's very difficult to put yourself in the mind of anybody else. It's, uh, my best experience was running a crew on a Lancaster. That was, and I had a lot of scouting, as I said, and they were my patrol. There were never any orders given. You just did things automatically and you looked after each other. And a team like that is a very good thing. If you've got a group, small group of friends that you're very happy with and you think along the same sort of lines, and what better can you do? And above all, never lose your sense of humour. <laughs>